Hello, this is Suzanne James from Go Left. Thank you for joining us. Today I will be interviewing Sam Wainwright. He is National Co-Convener of Socialist Alliance and is also running for the House of Representatives for the seat of Fremantle on a Socialist Alliance ticket in the upcoming federal election. Sam lives in O'Connor with his partner Janet, is a disability support worker, an ex warfie of 12 years experience, and he's also recently ex of the Fremantle City Council. Have I got that bio right, Sam? You yeah, have indeed. Yeah, that's right. So I was on, uh, I was a councillor at City of Fremantle for 12 years. Currently a disability support worker. He's running for the House of Representatives in the upcoming federal election as a Socialist Alliance candidate. Sam joins us now from Western Australia. Sam, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. Now, first of all, congratulations to Socialist Alliance for getting your re-registration done with the Australian Electoral Commission. Is it your view that new rules were designed to knock out micro parties like Socialist Alliance? And how hard was it to get the re-registration over the line with the new rules? Sure, look, for us, it did take a fair bit of work. Uh, previously, the, under the rules, you had to have 500 members to have electoral registration, which essentially means your party name appears on the ballot paper. Uh, but that was put up to one and a half thousand. So look, it took us a bit of a work, a bit, a bit of work, and it was a bit of a stretch. But we made it fairly easily in the end. And to be honest, it was actually a good exercise for us because it, it it gave us an opportunity to reach out to people um, who'd supported Socialist Alliance in the past but not joined, and to encourage them to join, uh, to spread the word, um, and to put our case to people why there needs to be a, um, a socialist voice come election time. The, the, the origin of the legislation itself, um, as I understand it, was the concern by the Liberal Party who wanted to get rid of um, other political parties using the word liberal in their name. That was the real kind of origin or genesis of the, of the, of the amendment to the Electoral Act. And so one of the things it does is basically says that only one political party can have a descriptor like liberal, labor or green or socialist in its name, unless it is prepared to share that with another with, with another party. So in our case, in Socialist Alliance, although we were the first organisation to have the word socialist registered in our name, you know, in our name, um, and registered with the Electoral Commission, uh, we don't object to other socialists um, who might differ from us also being registered. But the Liberal Party were very determined to 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 to, to block that out. Um, we don't think it makes sense because they're generic descriptors. Uh, but that's where it came from. And just as an aside, I think one thing that it's worth observing is that as the proportion of the as, as the, the proportion of the vote that goes to Labor and Liberal, uh, the first preference vote has declined historically uh, in this country over the last few decades. It has been a fairly consistent response of Labor and Liberal uh, to actually make it harder for other parties to, to run as a way of shoring up their vote. But anyway, that's... Um, they made it a bit harder for us, but uh, but we got there in the end and we're, we're happy to be running um, come May. I'd like to get some definition, if I may, around what Socialist mm. Alliance means in 2022 Australia. As you know, a lot of people in Australia don't understand what we, what we mean by socialist, let alone Socialist Alliance. It's often confused with communism, sometimes even fascism. Can you give us your best definition in 2022 Australia of what it means to be a socialist and what that means for Socialist Alliance, what it is as a party now? Yeah, um, there's actually a greater acceptance um, and interest in socialism, however that may be defined, and of course it's variously defined by different people, uh, but um, amongst young people in particular. Now that's, that's especially advanced in the United States where the majority of, of young people have a positive uh, view of socialism, however they might define it. Uh, but that's increasingly the case in Australia as well. So we tend not to find that the, sort of the hangover of the Cold War is not too much of a problem for us. Um, you know, I'm old enough to, rem to, 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 to remember being told, you know, to go back to Russia by people, but that's, that's pretty rare nowadays. We see socialism fundament most fundamentally as an extension of democracy to the economy and the workplace. And for that to happen, we think there needs to be the formation of a pro-working class anti-capitalist force in Australian politics. 
a political force that actively organises and is backed up by mass mobilisations in the streets, in the workplaces, in communities, at the places of, of, of education. A political project that seeks election to parliament, certainly, but that understands real lasting change will only come when we have a force that is capable of confronting the enormous economic, uh, political and cultural power of the, of the billionaires and, and their hangers on in, 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 in this country and, and, and globally. Now, we're sober about the situation. Such a force hasn't existed in Australia since the days of the old Communist Party. Now, we don't pretend to have all the answers in terms of how such a, a force might be recreated in Australia 2022. Um, we expect that we'll have to draw on socialists of the non-dogmatic variety, that it would need to draw on Greens coming to anti-capitalist conclusions, unionists breaking from the Labor Party, um, and who reject the adaptation of the Labor Party to anti-refugee and other racist politics, grassroots Indigenous and general community uh, uh, activists. And above all, we think such a force will emerge out of real life struggle. And as such, both Socialist Alliance and our election campaign, as we see it, are uh, a stepping stone or a contribution, a modest contribution to the process of the formation of a force in Australian politics, which hasn't happened yet, but it's our, it's our attempt to try and engage with others who agree with that and who agree that we need to try and push that along. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. You mentioned the Greens. I recently interviewed New South Wales Green, David Subridge, about their balance of power campaign in the Senate. I'd like to touch on some of his key issues and get Socialist Alliance view on those, if I may. Let's start with the federal ICAC. Now, that's way near the top of everybody's list right now. Does Socialist Alliance have a policy view on that? And if so, how do you see that coming to fruition? Yes, yeah, certainly. We, we absolutely agree that there does need to be a federal ICAC or similar body. Uh, just, just three you know, recent events in Australian politics bear that out. One was the, the appointment of fossil fuel executive Neville Power to the so-called COVID recovery task force that the Morrison government set up. So a, a basically a fracking a fracking executive who lo and behold suggests that we need more fracking to recover from COVID. You, know, you couldn't make this stuff up. Uh, the sports rorts um, grants thing as well. I mean, you know, you know some, some people don't grasp just how bad that sports rorts program was not just in the manipulation, but the fact that, you know, across the country, there are community organisations, you know, not-for-profit community sporting groups who would have devoted hours and hours of time into writing grant applications, not, not guaranteed that they would get the grant, but at least confident that there was, a, there was a reasonably impartial process that their grant would be assessed against. And then they find out that, no, uh, that's all just been thrown in the bin and you've got a Liberal minister just making it doling out the grants based on their political preference. Um, I mean, that is really, really, uh, a re really a terrible thing. Uh, and also, you know, on a similar, similar sort of scale is the, um, you know, the, the decision by to, to, to buy the um, land for the second Sydney airport, I mean, a grossly inflated price from the, um, from a, a significant donor to, to the Liberal Party. I mean, I think all these things sort of bear out that there's sort of too much of this sort of stuff goes on in a sort of a, a so-called commercial in confidence kind of environment uh, where it affects the public interest. I, my sense is that there will be, there is sufficient political pressure uh, and discussion around the need for a federal ICAC that the, that the Labor Party, uh, should it win government, will come good on that, on that commitment. Uh, I think the real uh, test will be be making sure it has sufficient powers to do its job, because this if you if you look at the um, the ICACs or the you know or the or the or the various versions of them around the, around the different states at the state level, like those powers um, do vary quite a lot. Yes, as as far as betrayals go, both parties have kicked ICAC down the road for so long now. It's definitely something that's high on everybody's electoral list when you talk to people on the hustings. Next on the list would have to be affordable housing. Now, the Greens are saying nothing less than a million affordable homes in 10 years at the rate of 100,000 a year, which is obviously a massive build and a massive spend. That's what it's going to take to even put a dent in it. I note that um, Socialist Alliance has quite extensive policies set out on their website in relation to all of these issues. But if you could just um, give us your overview in relation to what the Socialist Alliance policy is, in relation to housing and how you intend to address the housing crisis and how 
What's the party line and how you intend to fund that? Sure. Look, I think our starting point uh, need, <coughs> needs to be to, to, to win the argument in, in, in Australian politics and amongst the, the community more generally that guaranteeing access to affordable, dignified housing should be seen as a pu public obligation of the state. You know, it's, it's an obligation of the state in, in, in the way that most Australians would accept that education and healthcare need to be provided. And guaranteeing access to dignified and affordable housing is the sort of thing that should go in a Bill of Rights, um, which is something all, we also advocate for. In terms of the specifics of how to get there, I think the first thing is that we need to, we need to start removing a significant sector of housing from the market and putting it back into public housing, expanding the stock of public housing in this country. You know, most Australians would not be aware of the fact that even relative to, to other developed or OECD countries, our stock, our stock of public housing has, has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and it's tiny, it's down to about 4%. If you compare that to a country like Denmark, where it's 20%. So you can see that in Denmark, public housing still constant, is still a significant sector of the housing, the, the total housing stock. And in, in Australia, because it's shrunk down so much and to, to get into it, you know, you, you, you need to be poorer and poorer and poorer to qualify to get into public housing. You, we've got a growing sector of the population that are neither poor enough to qualify for public housing nor wealthy enough to be able to, 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 to afford private housing. We've just got to turn, turn that around and expand the, the stock of public housing. And that can be a combination both of new builds, uh, which we'd certainly support, but also uh, absorbing existing housing stock um, in, 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 into the public housing stock where appropriate as well. The second policy um, that we propose is to, is to remove private residential housing from the wild fluctuations in rental price and property speculation. And what I mean by that is that rental increases need to be pegged to CPI. And, and with that, we need to end no fault evictions. Now, in the Australian context, that sounds like a radical thing to say, but it's worth remembering that that is actually quite normal practice in a number of European countries. Yeah. So it basically says to property investors, yeah, you can make a buck out of investing in residential property. You can make a pretty much a guaranteed regular re re return, but one, you have to recognise that housing is a human right and you can't just kick people out in the street on a moment's notice. And two, um, you can't just you, you you can't speculatively increase um, um, rents. We, we we need to get rid of this whole sort of rental auctions phenomenon that happens in Australia. It's just grotesque. The third thing that we'd be proposing is that vacant private rentals, after a certain period, should be brought in and managed by the public housing sector. So we need to get rid of this situation where we have. Uh, I've heard. Don't I mean I can't sort of quote you the exact statistics, but in in the city of Melbourne, for instance, I've heard that there are more rough sleepers, sorry, there are more empty housing units, there are more empty apartments than there are rough sleeping homeless people. So we, we just need to get rid of this um, this property speculation thing with resi with residential properties. If 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 you're not you know if 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 you own vacant rental property and it sits there idle for more than six months, then it needs to be compulsory. Put, put, put back into the pool um, and, and, and managed by the public housing sector if need be. And fourthly, uh, and I think you've, you, you've, um, you'd be aware this is, there's been a lot of discussion about this, is that we need to end the tax breaks that function as welfare to landlords um, and encourage investment in housing for purely speculative purposes. So I think by combining all those things, we can, um, we can start to turn the situation around um, and turn around, start to turn around this terrible situation where Australia truly is, uh, you know, we, we, we have a housing affordability crisis and Australia is, is, is amongst, even relative to other OECD countries, is amongst the worst in the world. I think one of the major issues with people getting into secure housing, obviously, is lack of assistance when unemployed or homeless. Now, everybody, including the Greens, ACOS, even some of the business lobby, agree that $80 a day should be the social security payment minimum. The Socialist Alliance agree with that. And how do you see the social security system being restructured to facilitate that? 
Look, we do agree with that. Um, although I'd add that we think that should be a first a first step towards a towards a more humane and digni dig dignified uh, payment system. Essentially, our policy is that all welfare payments need to be lifted above the poverty line, and then be indexed to maintain real va real value, including housing. Um, and you know, the po just bear in mind that the poverty line, last I checked in Australia, for a single person is five hundred eighty-one dollars a week. Um, so you'd nearly have to double um, New Start or Job Seeker, as it's called now, uh, to to achieve that. And I think this also connects back to the previous issue that we we're talking about, that of housing, uh, because in in a situation where you have um, property prices and rents galloping ahead of CPI, pumping up people's welfare payments so they can so they can pay spiralling rents, ends up being another form of of um, welfare to landlords and helps inflame the problem. Um, and we, you know, it's it, it we need to tackle it from the other end by actually bringing down the cost of housing and expanding the stock of public housing. Um, so that's that's an important thing. The, the other thing in terms of the operation of the welfare system is we strongly believe that we need to get rid of the sort of what we call the rent seeking private employment agencies that were created um, by, the, by, by the job network uh, and re-establish the CES, um, the Commonwealth Employment Service. Uh, which old, older viewers would be familiar with that name, you know, anyone under the age of 30 may not uh, be familiar with the CES. Um, but there's an important principle here. If, if, if a job is so important that it needs doing and it needs to be paid for with public money, it should be done by public servants. The idea that we contract out the provision of essential public services to private organisations, whether for profit or NGOs, um, has got to come to an end. Now, I'm not absolute about that. There are going to be some circumstances where some, some, there are some not-for-profit NGOs occupying particular niches that, 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 do, that do good work, such as the cooperative housing sector. But in general, if it's being paid for with public money, it should be done by a government agency, by public servants, being paid public servant wages. We've seen this contracting out of all manner of service provision, including welfare, just as a way of driving down costs and funneling money uh, to private interests. Speaking of privatisation, and I take your point in increasing social security payments, feeding into spiralling rents, we saw very similar phenomena when the governments here first introduced the first homeowners grant. I was working in banking at the time and all it did was knock out more of the low income competition and the parents buying a second and third investment property for their children simply paid another five grand. Um, and it, the prices just kept going up. So in relation to privatisation, unfortunately, quite a significant chunk of Australia's assets at both state and federal level have been privatised or so-called public-private split, which is basically privatisation by stealth with extended leases, as you pointed out, in relation to the McGowan government plan to um, semi-privatise the new Fremantle port. But a lot of these things aren't going to be able to be undone either in a physical contract sense or in an ec in economy wider economy sense what do you say to people that say how can you possibly unscramble such a majorly privatized egg that's occurred over so many years how, how do you plan to address that look uh i agree with you that it's it's it, it's, uh, it's going to be a complicated problem uh to solve uh, we're firmly of the view that strategic monopolised sectors of the economy uh, do need to be brought into democratic public ownership uh, if we're to make society more democratic, uh, we're, if we're to address the ecological crisis and if we're to achieve significant uh, wealth redistribution. So there's a few ways we can approach that. First is um, e expanding the existing public sector and then some of those sectors are going to have to be renationalised, and I think in each instance it, it will require a consideration of whether, if, how, and when that should happen, with or without comp compensation. And other, and there might be other mechanisms that are used, where, for instance, um, shares can be swapped out for that is to say ownership be swapped out for bonds in in circumstances where the the capitalist owner. Um, does get compensated because the other complication in, in addition to the um, uh, 
the circumstance that you mentioned um, is also the fact that often our superannuation funds are embedded in these things as well. Um, so we need to find a, find a way to to bring that, you know, what's important is bringing these things back into democratic public, so is, is, is that the, the investment decisions are made in, 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 it, in, in the public good, uh, where there are small shareholders or superannuation funds owned by Australian workers that are invested in those things, obviously we need to find mechanisms to ensure that those people aren't, um, aren't, aren't sort of done out of income and plunged into poverty. I think it's going to be, it's obviously it's going to be a, it's going to be a complex process. We know that the, um, the Labor Party balked at it, <laughs> at nationalising the banks um, way, way back when in the 1940s. Um, so mm. it's going to need a, a, a you know, a, a complex both political and legal approach, but above all too, um, it will need a serious mobilisation of public support behind it to stare down the, the scare campaign that would accompany any, even the most modest steps in that direction. You're going to have some serious issues with all of those things trying to force change on the floor of the House, whether it be the House of Representatives or the Senate. Are you, as a Socialist Alliance national convener and a candidate, prepared to give us some insight into what kind of coalitions and cooperations you would expect your party would be able to make in relation to issues like this, for example, um, cooperating with the Greens and other parties specifically in relation to deprivatisation matters? Yes, look, I think for us to win advances on any front, societal, transition to a sustainable economy, wealth redistribution, all of those things, are, we, we just need to accept the fact are going to require real struggle serious serious popular movements to, 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 to implement that kind of change um, even in the even the most modest I mean it's worth thinking about the, the the proposals put forward by Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn when they ran for their you know um, in, in their respective election campaigns even the most modest proposals uh, would face just fierce resistance um, in the media on the floor of Parliament and elsewhere sabotage, um, by powerful vested interests, by big capitalists, basically, no, you know, none of those things are going to, would have been achieved, and, and none of the things that we we've been talking about could seriously be, be achieved. Uh, you know, if, even if we got to the point of having a majority on the floor of parliament to achieve these kinds of transformations, the transformations that are absolutely necessary if we had to stop runaway global warming uh, and to make Australia a better and more democratic place, it, they're just not going to be achieved without with, without essentially building united fronts, drawing in everyone, every political force, every person, every union, every political party that agrees with a specific objective, socialist, green, labor, unions, whatever. Uh, that's, that's, that, that's where, you know, we need, we absolutely, we're gonna need, need to build that unity to achieve those kinds of victories. That's the lesson of history um, and, it's, it, and it's gonna remain that way. Okay. That leads us nice, nicely into the question, last but not least, of climate change. Now, a green, clean economy has become a no-brainer. Just about everybody, with the exception of the LNP, agrees that that's the direction markets are going in globally. But we've currently got an economic and a quality crisis in Australia that's been driven by so many things, including the climate crisis. And we've got too many MPs in Canberra, as you say, that have long since become hostage to the fossil fuel lobby, uh, except that the Greens have had some success in New South Wales with moving towards a more green economy with um, Matt Keane's roadmap, although it's not um, without its major issues, especially including, it still includes gas and doesn't necessarily specify clean gas other than hydrogen. There's a few issues with that there. So you've got a very comprehensive set of climate policies on your website. And I accept that that sets out everything in full. But as you point out, we may well have less than 10 years to get all this done before the climate crisis is tipped over the edge. And I've, I've interviewed a number of people, including professors of economics and science who've agreed with that. 10 years, if we're lucky, to start to turn it around. So that being the case, out of all of those things Socialist Alliance has listed, and of all the obvious benefits of socioeconomic greenery, as it were, what would you target first? What's the most urgent things that can realistically get done that is going to assist turn the climate crisis around in the next 10 years? 
Yeah, look, I think, you know, one thing we can say about um, the climate crisis is that it's not just another issue on our shopping list of issues, but it is the existential issue facing humanity. I mean, if we don't stop more than 1.5 degrees of warming, warming, we face a hothouse earth, and that means a planet um, that we just wouldn't recognise. Um, so, but, the, you know, the, the, the inspiring thing, of course, is all the things that we need to do to stop runaway global runaway global warming are all the things that we, we need to do anyway. So a transition away from, from, from fossil fuels for stationary electricity generation, a shift to sustainable farming and, and, and the mass application of, 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 orga of organic agricultural principles, livable mm -hmm. cities in which the car is a supplementary form of transport, not the dominant form of transport. All those, all those things combined create the better sort of world we want to live in anyway. Now, I think that, uh, a green economy, a sustainable economy, requires fundamentally requires a democratization of the economy in a way that I described before. That is to say, there's just no possibility, in my opinion, of creating a green capitalism. There might be in some sort of abstract sense, um, but the idea that we're going to create a green capitalism is a pipe dream for two reasons. Cap firstly, capitalism is, is, is driven to constantly to, it to, is driven towards limitless growth, even though we live on a finite planet. And, you know, in the abstract, you might be able to conceive of a capitalism where all the growth just goes into sort of into service, into, into growth of the service sector, and there's no more consumption of actual stuff. Uh, but I, I can't see that, ha that happening in the real world. Um, and the second problem with, with capitalism, of course, is that because it's driven by, by competition of, for profits, each capitalist enterprise is driven to externalize the true cost of production onto the environment and society. Now, when I say that, I don't mean to say that every sector of the economy needs to be um, brought into public ownership overnight, like some crash course of the Soviet Union in the 1930s, every small business or every restaurant or cafe. But the sectors we've talked about before, the big monopolized sectors of the economy, the big resource projects, telecommunications, airlines, electricity generation, that does need to be brought into democratic public ownership if we'd be able to go down the path of, 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 of the sort of transformation we need. And that's where I think it's, I think probably the theme, before getting to a specific action, I think the theme running through that process needs to be the engagement of workers in that process of transformation. Now, it, it, now, I live in WA, and WA, like Queensland, is very much a resource and fossil fuel dependent state. So the mm -hmm. idea that we're going to win a political majority for the transformation we need by saying to workers in those industries and workers in, the, in, these, in, in these states are, oh, you know, we've got to get rid of your industry, but, you know, your relatively well-paid unionised industry, but we're going to create a great job. There'll be a job for you in Perth or Brisbane driving an Uber at 14 bucks an hour. It's not going to work. What we need to be able to say to the workers in those industries is that, we're going to need your skills, your ability, and your passion to achieve the transformation we need. You're going to be building the offshore wind farms, the solar thermal farms, uh, the pumped hydro, all that sort of stuff. They've got to own that process and be convinced that they're going to have a better life for them, themselves, and their children in the process. I think that's, that's a theme that's going to be running through our vision of transformation. I mean, I think a very good place to start, and the Greens, I'm, I'm glad to say the Greens have, uh, have recently come on board with this idea, is that we need to, a good place to start is by building publicly owned renewable energy. Now, if we can do that, 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 that then becomes a stepping stone to the kind of transformation and the kind of economy we need more generally, and that's one I'd put a strong emphasis on. You covered a lot of ground there, Sam. Thank you so much for giving us your view of the future for the Socialist Alliance and for the country. I'd like to wish you the best of luck with your campaign for the seat of Fremantle, and I hope we can talk again soon. Thanks very much, Suzanne. I appreciate it. That was Sam Wainwright, Socialist Alliance candidate for the House of Representatives for the seat of Fremantle in the upcoming federal election. It's one to watch. I'm Suzanne James for Green Left. Thank you for joining us.